think when someone is diagnosed, they're feeling hopeless, where do we go, where do we turn? And mo most often they're told to go home and take care of their affairs. And I think this is a place where they can come, where they know uh, we will be there with them through the duration, through the course of their disease. We will, we will give them hope. The ALS Regional Center is nothing fancy on the outside, but sometimes the simplest packages hold the most treasured gifts because behind these doors is hope and help. Do you know anything at all about ALS before you were diagnosed? He knew about Lou Gehrig. Andrew is struggling to hang on to his speech while the muscles that force the sound from his mouth waste away. Four years ago, he was playing football for fun and traveling the globe for work when things started going horribly wrong. And his symptoms started with slurred speech, and it was so mild that we thought it was allergies. We went to every allergist trying to find out why he was speaking so nasally. Um, and then it started to progress where people thought that maybe he was intoxicated um, when he was at work. And when he was traveling and when he'd be tired and fatigued, his speech would get worse and his co-workers were finally noticing and he would call home and I would ask him, Andrew, what is going on? Um, because his speech was so hard to understand and that's when we realized that we had to, you know, investigate. And so Andrew and Kelly eventually came to the ALS Regional Center where he visits the loner closet whenever he needs new equipment to help him through the latest stage of his disease. With ALS it progresses so quickly that you're constantly modifying how you do things. I remember for Andrew's 40th birthday when I came home with the purple walker. Not that it was a present you wanted to get but it sure made our life easier and safer. Now we have blue. <laughs> As for Kelly, having a young family and a husband dependent on her strength can take a toll. And I am his arms, his legs, and his voice. He still has the smarts, but, <laughs> um, but we just, um, it's a lot. It's physically and emotionally draining, and um, the centers really here, they have after our caregiving groups that have just meant the world to me. So the family does their best and then waits for the MDA scientists to do their best. It's clear that your life depends on this research. Our family's life depends on that research. Bruce, what is your reality of ALS? That somewhere down the road, it may get real bad. Bruce Flagler goes through four or five steno pads a week. Unlike Andrew, he still works, plays golf, even joins the pit crew at Lebanon Valley Speedway. But ALS stole his speech about two years ago and eventually his ability to eat or drink. How has ALS affected you emotionally? Very hard in the beginning. But now I won't let it win. What does that mean to you, you won't let it win? I won't give up or quit what I do. Karen speaks for Bruce in many ways, not just to communicate, but to advocate and provide for him and her 100 or so other clients. This is a disease that takes so much courage and because people lose their ability to get out at times, to be able to speak, the center and MDA need to be their voice. This needs to be a safe place where they know their care, um, they're cared about, and there is a sense of hope here. And so the center provides wheelchairs and augmentative devices, doctors and family counselors. And when it's not speaking out, it's listening. They work very hard and care to help us get through this big bump in the road of life. People have been very kind here to us and our family. And one of the things that Andrew had said early on is that when a lot of the other professionals told us, um, basically go home and get your affairs in order, um, the ALS Center welcomed us with open arms and gives us hope. <laughs>